I call this meeting to order. Thank you all for being here today. It's, uh, it should prove to be an interesting day, <laughs> as they say in China. So uh, we, Ron, do you have the agenda to put up? But I, I can go for my own copy of it, that's fine. It's, it's up, you should be seeing it, right? Mm -hmm. Once more, through the fog. Okay, um, let's see if I change the view. No. I'm not seeing the agenda, Ron. Clear on my end. Yeah. Is I everybody see else seeing the agenda? Yeah. Is anybody not seeing the agenda? Well, you know what? I can bring the agenda up from my from here on my other big screen. There it is, okay. All right, I now see an alternate copy of the agenda. So, uh, first off, the meeting summary from the last uh, meeting, we all carefully read that and have our comments ready. Anybody have anything to say about it or any corrections specifically? Nope. Okay. So we'll move on to the dashboard. And uh, fortunately, Rebecca's with us and she's going to talk about the dashboard. And I know, Lynn, you've also had some input in that as well. So go ahead, Rebecca. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, I don't know that I'll, I'll need the full 20 minutes, but I guess we'll see where the discussion takes us. Uh, what I wanted to offer the committee today is just an update on a conversation I had with RTD actually this morning. I want to thank Doug McLeod and Director Geisinger um, for the time. Uh, really, I wanted to get a sense of where RTD was headed anyhow, because I think we've talked on this committee before that RTD was interested in moving in this direction and, and had done some initial work to look, about, look at creating some dashboards around greater transparency. Uh, a couple months ago, we'd also shown uh, CDOT's dashboards, which is specific to our Senate Bill 267 projects. Um, what I, I gathered today, and I inv would invite Lynn and, and Doug to add in if they're on, but um, you know, RTD is probably still in the, the early steps with onboarding their new GM. Uh, I think they want to speak more with Deborah and and get her thoughts and haven't had a chance to do that yet. They have spoken to one potential company, but I, you know, RTD is aware as, as many of us are, there is a lot of, um, lot of vendors in this space who help government agencies with dashboarding. DDOT uses several within our own agency. So I think uh, their next step would be to issue an RFP and they haven't started that process yet. So what that means for our work is I think our recommendations are, are timely and would be helpful to RTD as they sort of form that, that RFP. And here's my, my thinking of how we wanna approach this, kind of understanding that the operations committee is looking into some dashboards too around performance measures. And, and thank you, Rhett, for sharing that information with me. But as I look at this landscape, I'm sort of seeing sort of three buckets of, of transparency work. And I'll, I'll throw these out for discussion with the group, but there's dashboards around performance measures. And it sounds like RTD um, tracks a number of very specific uh, performance, you know, on-time boardings and, and things that are just sort of the, uh, the crux of how a transit um, agency operates. But it sounds like there's some room um, and some interest in some broader performance dashboard reporting. And that's where it looks like the operations committee is looking at too. Um, you know, I'd say for, if I was to compare it to CDOT, we do dashboards around the major goals we set for the agency every year. So looking at the particular moment in time that CDOT is at and what we want to achieve over a year with our ED, I think that sort of parallel structure would be um, also helpful with, with RTD, and it sounds like they're open to that and want to involve their GM 
So there's there's sort of that whole section of performance dashboards, setting goals and, and showing the public how you're working towards those is that one bucket. The second area I would put around financial transparency. And I think that can take the form of dashboards or even just some things like uh, a one sheet budget or just simpler ways to explain the budget. Uh, Doug walked me through the materials they have on their website. I think a lot of our committee has dived into that too. It's pretty easy to get uh, six or seven layers down into a spreadsheet. A lot of information is on there, but it's, I, don't, I couldn't tell really where it was rolled up and even kind of a one sheet and, and other ideas. And I think having our committee Rut, talk about that specifically would be helpful so we can craft some recommendations around financial transparency. And again, I'm not sure it has to be dashboards, but there's some steps short of that that I think would help. And then the third category I would say would be transparency around projects or buckets of projects. And for RTD, that's probably fast tracks <laughs> and just given the interest and in showing um, really in a clearer way so the public can say, go to one place and see um, how fast tracks is delivered, what the debt load is, the status on Northwest Rail. I think pieces of all that are out there, but it sounds like there could be some need to consolidate that. So let me pause there maybe and see if Doug and Lynn have see, ask if I misstated anything. Um, Matthew and Natalie were on the call this morning as well. If I could make one quick comment. Uh, first off, it seems like you've got the right vision. Uh, I, I do want to try to do all that we can to to and remember we make recommendations we don't say this is what you have to do but to, to say that we want to minimize the load on RTD staff in implementing something like this and you know there's terrific content out there on their website what there what there isn't is there isn't a uh, in some cases, the kind of layering that you may need if you want to provide information to the general public, that's different than if you want to give Dr. Cog or another agency like that the ability to dive deep into financial issues and budgets and things like that. We need to be able to do both of those things. And other, but, but as I said before, there is a lot of information out. It's a matter of mm -hmm. how do you really make it as accessible? And how do you make the dashboard something people want to use as opposed to uh, something that's, you know, they don't even know exists in too many cases. And how do we also, it's one other point, how do we make the public aware that there is this dashboard? So with that, I, you know, I, I'll butt out and I'm eager to hear comments from Lynn and others about, uh, or Doug, about this. Right, I know I'm not a committee member. Rebecca, who's the audience for the dashboard concept, or this, this transparency? You know, ideally, I think you'd want to orient it to the general public. Um, I know that's not very often that uh, Joe Blow on the street gets, gets onto these sites, but I think that's, they need to be that simple. But certainly the state legislature would be an audience, um, peer agencies. Uh, I, I, I guess I can only offer that when CDOT builds them, we have the sort of general public in mind. Okay. Be, well, the, uh, the other audience that's obvious to me are, are all the other nonprofits out there who mm -hmm. depend on RTD and who's, who the people they represent depend on RTD. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of people that want information. And it would be nice if, if they don't have to go to, to RTD every time they want information. Part of this is how do you lighten the burden on RTD as well by having a dashboard. Okay, others. Unfortunately, I can't always see, I can't see everybody on my screen and uh, uh, we're having a little trouble with the raise your hand function. So uh, if, if it's there for you, there is a, there is the possibility of using the raise your hand function, but if not, uh, I would encourage you to uh, just unmute your microphone and say, may I make a comment as well? And identify yourself. And Chris, you can make a comment. comment anytime you want to. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. So this is Elise. Can Elise, I just? Elise, yes. 
Um, thanks for that update, Rebecca. That sounds spot on. I guess in terms of um, sort of the accountability committee's recommendation, if I heard you correctly, it would be urge to urge RTD to move quickly to put put out an RFP and, and develop this dashboard. And then we would add to that recommendation um, things that we think would be important to include on that dashboard, both from the financial standpoint and from the performance standpoint. And so it's a matter of sort of working through what those specific um, details are that the, this committee thinks would be important to highlight. Agree, and I, I think, um, I, Day, I see you on here. I understand there's a key discussion March 17th with your group on the performance dashboards. So I'd like to, to connect up with you and, and maybe make this part one overall recommendation instead of um, bifurcating it, but um, let me know if that makes sense from your end. Yeah, this is Daya, I can jump in. Um, so the operations committee is looking at um, specific metrics and we've been kind of doing a little bit of research ourselves and identifying what are some um, some operational metrics. What, are, what is it that RTD is currently using? And rather than recreating the wheel, again, taking the, the, the infrastructure that RTD currently has and just simplifying it for the general public or, or, or presenting it in such a way that's, um, that's user-friendly. I think one thing that we um, have talked about is using or tapping into some of the capacity from the, the consultants North Highlands to help us identify and just kind of align that to best practices as well. Um, so yes, I do think one thing that we focused on in the operations committee is looking at um, efficiency and effectiveness as kind of those two kind of big broad goals and then paring it down. But I will, I will just share that finance is not something that we've looked at. And I think that's where this could definitely um, align nicely. That's why we have three committees. <laughs> but hey, hey Daya, I, if I could, right, right, real quick, one other thing I think out of operations, Day, I think you, I think we would all agree with this. One of our other goals for the dashboard out of operations is that it actually be useful to RTD to, to be a tool that they can use to see how they're doing. So it's not just, mm -hmm. A reporting to the general public and to the legislature, but it's also a place where they could say, they could organizing things like, hey, we need this dashboard to be better. Does that make sense? So it's an organizational management tool, not just a reporting mm -hmm. tool. Right. Good point. Yeah. And as I was, as I was saying, it, this really is something that needs to come from all three committees. All three subcommittees need to have a lot of input and Rebecca is a terrific person for connecting. And and uh, and working with with uh, different groups to get their input, so it's in good hands. One other thing that I would say in, in our recommendations, I think we ought to put in a recommendation to RTD that once they get it up to a, a reasonable state, that they engage the public and get that feedback. That they really have that public discussion, and I'm sure they'll do some of that early on. But uh, once you've got some stakeholders that are interested in the dashboard, I think it's going to going to move faster than we might think. Okay. I'll think yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually have not been that close to this particular issue. I, I was in the meeting with Rebecca and Doug this morning and I've been following it. I think Shelly Cook and uh, Peggy Catlin from the board have been driving this more. Um, and Doug can, can speak more to sort of where the agency is. I know they've looked at a particular software that's a budgeting sort of software balancing act um, and maybe some others and, and are moving towards an RFP. And, um, you know, I think with, uh, it's been percolating for a while, the, the board and, and the agency, I think, shares the goals that um, uh, we need to uh, talk about it a lot, the need for more transparency. And, and this is a, a big piece of that. Um, and I think, you know, in addition to all of the other um, audiences, as um, as Chris was pointing out, just something that makes especially the budgeting process and some of the financials more accessible, um, I think, to the board and to the staff is uh, a good goal. So uh, I will turn it over to Doug, but um, it has been the topic of much conversation. I know that, you know, it was before with uh, Heather McKillop there, um, you know, we've kind of 
it's it's slowed down as we've been been in the midst of a pandemic and a new general manager. Although I think it's a high priority for her, she's just got a lot of high priorities right now. <laughs> so uh, maybe Doug can be more specific. If I may speak prior to you, Doug, if that's if that's okay, just to orient everybody from the vantage point in which I'm coming because I've been referenced quite a bit. So keeping in mind, I understand the importance of transparency and I'm here for that. So please understand my position in which I'm conveying. I do think there is one element that I'm not clear on as we talk about the intersectionality because we're talking about a dashboard and a scorecard and we want people to have an understanding of what we're doing being good stewards or financial, being financial stewards. With that as a backdrop, the one missing piece for me is when we look at a dashboard and a scorecard interchangeably, we need to ensure that we have key performance indicators that clearly identify how we're optimizing those dollars. And right now we're talking solely about uh, a, a software program that will enable people to understand how we're leveraging dollars. But the greater picture holistically is how are we performing with said dollars? So recognizing that there's a step in the right direction relative to that. However, within the organization ourselves, we need to ensure that we're creating alignment about what our strategic priorities are because the point that Director Geisinger just raised saying that I have a lot of priorities. Well, if I have a lot of priorities, I don't have any priorities because nothing all can be a priority. So I just wanted to put that out there while I'm committed to this. I think there's a missing piece as we talk about a scorecard and a dashboard because that's integral in reference to having the vast majority of the public garner an understanding of what we're doing with the taxpayer, with their taxpayer dollars. And so I just wanted to put that into perspective for everyone to understand as we do our due diligence, because one thing's for certain when I came on board and I created, uh, I had Doug and the chief operations officer and some other people look at this tool that Director Geisinger referenced, what we wanted to ensure we did was reach out and talk to individuals that are actually using set platforms so we'd have a better understanding of the optimization in which the data we're ascertaining could be a benefit to those that may not know our operating space. So I just wanted to impart that all with you today. Thanks. Thank you, General Manager Johnson. This is Doug McLeod. Yeah, and it, I think all the points have been hit and I appreciate you um, saying that. Um, General Manager Johnson. And thank you uh, also, Rebecca, for describing that. I think you hit all the points where we were headed um, as an organization in trying to be tra more transparent. We do realize, and we have realized for quite some time, that what we're putting out on our website is um, a little more detailed, and you have to do some hunting and pecking to find what you want. And we, we know that we can be a, um, do a better job of um, communicating, especially not in detailed financial terms that don't translate well to the public at large, as well as to our board. Um, so yes, that's that's definitely um, one of our initiatives. Um, I would say that we're in the discovery phase, as uh, General Manager Johnson um, mentioned. Right now, we've only looked at one software package. Um, we're, we'll have to, when we go out to RFP, we'll have to develop a scope of work and be pretty specific as to what we're looking for, because it appears there's multiple different software packages out there. Some are uh, much more involved than others. So we're gonna have to um, determine what it is that uh, with public input, with input from others, um, you know, what works most effectively. But a, a key part of that, as uh, General Manager Johnson mentioned, is before we can develop those measurements is we need to, to determine what measurements actually uh, help us in our strategic uh, direction. I could make a brief comment on that. I, I find that software vendors tend to sell on uh, functionality and all of the things it can do and all the ifs, but simplicity and, and the lack of complexity is, is uh, very critical in evaluating software packages. I mean, if you look at ones like Word and Excel and all that, they have great deep functionality, but boy, they can get it can get really hard to find anything sometimes. And so try to, try to, we need to have something at least in the forward facing part of it that's, that's gonna be reasonably easy to navigate. Yes, and Mr. Chair, if I may add, um, the, uh, we did, and uh, Rebecca, during her due diligence, did ask some of those questions. And that's one of the other determining factors too, is you know, what administrative involvement is involved from RTD standpoint, because it runs a gamut from as, the simple dashboards where we populate, um, periodically populate data, say at month end close, we can populate additional financial data or additional performance data 
to other packages that are much more involved in terms of um, creating interfaces between our systems that pull in information that are more interactive. So that, that's part of the, the <laughs> equation as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough decision. I, you know, my background software startups and boy, I tell you, I've, I've seen feature creep kill a lot of products, a lot of good products. Brett, this is Dea. I yeah, Dea. have a quick question, um, and I'm not quite sure who this is directed towards, so I, uh, I'm i just going to share it. Um, I, I am very much of the belief that software is just the tool. It's just the mechanism to ultimately get the information out there, but we do need to identify what those key success indicators or performance measures are um, to ultimately tell us whether or not we are moving the needle in terms of how RTD is, is, is achieving its overall mission and vision and goal and work, work in the community. I guess I'm curious if there has been any thought or any insight from the board or yourself, um, General Manager Johnson, around what some potential um, indicators might be, even in, in very draft form. Is there anything that you might be able to offer the committee that we can take into consideration? So thank you very much for that question. I think that's a very good question. And um, recognizing coming into this organization that I come from the vantage point that there needs to be a holistic alignment around what it is we're striving for. So recognizing that typically there's a vision, there's a mission, there's values, and then there's priorities identified based upon what those organizational functions are, because they should be the pillars upon which decisions are made. We're in the process right now where there's an active solicitation whereby we're looking for a consultant to help lead us in reference to identifying what our North Star is. I, I can't go into too much detail considering that we are in a blackout period currently, but recognizing as we go through this effort, there will be stakeholder engagement. That was one facet of uh, the solicitation that was put forward. And this will basically be the foundation as we go forward that will enable us to identify what our key performance indicators are, because once there's alignment around what those priorities are, then everybody in the organization from the individual aspect, considering people are comprising the organization, and then departmentally, what is feeding up into that aspirational vision of where we're trying to be. So that's where we are currently, and I would, I would surmise uh, that we would be on a path to have that clearly identified uh, relative to what those priorities are um, within, uh, you know, the July timeframe optimally. Remember, I feel like I just read um, Good to Great. Oh. <laughs> That's a really short well, version. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Chris. I'm one. I believe you can't measure what you can't manage. And right now with basically ascertaining what it is that we're, we are trying to do. And I think this will chart the path for what it is relative to this dashboard. That's why you hear my passion as I talk about, hold up, this is where we're going and this is what we aspire to do. So uh, thank you for indulging me. Yeah, that's good. That goes back I, Ron, I would say I think that as our as part of our advice is saying that that needs to be an outcome, not necessarily tomorrow morning. Is that there's a good dashboard, a clear thing, but it, that it matches up with what the organization is trying to achieve. So, um, there you go. That's my two cents. Good. Uh, yeah, and the other thing I'd say is is uh, CEO Johnson has been around a variety of different transit agencies and, and probably has a pretty good idea of what some of those uh, critical performance measures are. Uh, there are best practices out there and I'm, I'm sure you're already aware of what a lot of them are, but every transit agency is unique. So are there any other comments or questions? I just, I uh, read if I may have a follow-up with the comment Elise made. Um, Elise, were you thinking that we may want to look at another kind of uh, pre-final report recommendation in this area, or are we all comfortable with this being sort of part of our roll-up at the end? Um, I wasn't necessarily suggesting we do something um, immediate. I was more okay. um, just trying to bring closure to the conversation and figure out how this conversation will result in words on a paper in our yeah. final recommendations. Okay, good. Thank you. Good, good point. And, and the other point I think that's important here is that we're working with RTD as well in, in the process of creating our recommendation. So there probably won't be a lot of surprises when the final one comes out. 
which is another reason why we're not, we, we don't, for something like this, need to get it out there uh, sooner rather than later. We need to get it right. <laughs> Mr. Chair, can I just opine on that? And I, I, I want to say thank you for that because I know we've had discussions around, you know, recommendations and you all have shared some things with me and I appreciate that going forward. I want to ensure as the leader of this organization that we are being responsive. And so when we get those recommendations that it comes in a formalized manner. So then in turn, we are held accountable for responding to those and have a very scripted process in reference to the timeline in which we need to provide that in the format so it's readily available and transparent to all so folks have an understanding of what it is that we intend to do. So thank you for clarifying that. Certainly and, and I want to say how much we appreciate you taking the time to participate in these meetings as well and certainly uh, Lynn is, as well. Uh, it's great to have people from RTD that are that have that visibility into what we're doing. I mean, accountability and openness and all those things applies to us as well. So, all right, Rebecca, any closing comment or anything? Are we ready to move on? I think we're ready to move on. Um, Daya, I, I will follow up with you separately and uh, hope to join your committee meeting on the 17th. Great. Okay. Uh, now we're going to move on to what has to be probably uh, the most challenging discussion we'll have today, and that is on unfinished corridors. And so, uh, Ron, uh, can you bring up the map of the unfinished corridors just so we all know what we're talking about here? Let me know when it's up since I can't see it. I am working on it. Okay. Um, no, no big surprise here. Uh, I think we most of us know what these are. There's, uh, there are the Highlands Ranch extension of CD, which is not a, a really big one. Uh, there is the North Line, uh, Line N, which is substantial. And um, then we've got Northwest Rail. Did I miss one? Good. There's a there's a central there's a central extension as well, and in the oh, in the that. in the staff report materials for the committee in the agenda packet, there was um, a table listing all of the um, uh, four unfinished corridors. So so the central rail extension, the North Metro completion, Northwest Rail, and the Southwest extension are the four. And Mr. Chair. Um, I know Bill Van Meter is is also here. If if you want him to do a you know five minute sort of just quick summary of sort of the status of the unfinished um, fast tracks corridors and um, a summary of the discussion they had with the board on the uh, study session a few weeks ago, that would be great. Available. Bill, are you online? Good. Yes, I am. Please, uh, we we love extemporaneous requests like this, don't we? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Um, yeah, but uh, happy to, to do that and try to give just a real brief summary of um, that presentation and deep dive discussion that we had with our board on February 9th and then kind of where, where we stand on our action, um, action report um, that is due within 60 days to our board of directors. So at that meeting, um, we went through a little bit of the fast tracks history, some of the points that um, you Rutt, put um, in your um, accompanying document in the agenda today. Right. Um, the cost escalation and revenue declines as a result of the Great Recession and RTD's response to that, and including um, both internal and external oversight and, and response and um, proceeding with public-private partnerships. So we gave, gave a feel as to the history and background. And then um, we provided a current status and a summary of that was also provided by Dr. Cog's staff in the agenda in terms of those projects, their current projected ridership 
estimates as well as capital costs and operating costs. We reviewed that with the, the, those sorts of information with the board of directors, as well as the establishment of the Fast Track's internal savings account and, and how that has diverted some funds from the base system service improvements that were originally identified as part of the Fast Track's plan and um, have some other funding sources um, with the intent of being able to support Fast Tracks and build out of those four projects. Um, then we took a deeper dive on the Northwest Rail Corridor, gave a summary of the information and work that has been done to date, including the environmental evaluation that was completed in 2010, work with the BNSF. BNSF has been supportive when RTD has asked them for support in terms of trying to figure out how to operate a commuter rail line on a shared track with their freight services, our Northwest Area Mobility Study. Um, then we went through, um, which was completed in 2014. So we went through those items and um, looked at kind of, and presented and discussed the current state of our understanding of the Northwest Rail Corridor, which was based on those studies that were completed in 2010 through 2014, really. Yeah. And then um, bringing, bringing the board up to speed on those current discussions that we've had with stakeholders and their um, at local government stakeholders, um, their strong interest in that peak service plan, which would be three trips in the morning and peak from Longmont to Denver Union Station, and then three return trips from Denver Union Station along the corridor through Boulder back to Longmont. So um, significantly less cost, less ridership, still a, a pretty high cost. And um, one that RTD doesn't foresee being able to afford in the near, near future. We ran through our 2019 unfinished quarters report that looked at a number of different scenarios, funding scenarios, trying to, to say um, with no new revenues or with additional revenues, um, what could RTD accomplish in both the capital as well as that ongoing operating and maintenance costs, which are significant in, for a transit project and for a transit agency. Um, and really kind of concluded that without new revenues, that there are severe constraints on the fast tracks budget and capacity to deliver new projects beyond those that we have delivered to, to date. And then we kind of rounded that presentation out with some um, key points regarding the potential for partnerships. So one, under the current FTA, Federal Transit Administration New Starts and Small Starts programs, there are no um, grant funding opportunities for the Northwest Rail Corridor. It simply isn't a strong enough corridor to um, qualify in a competitive um, grant funding regime. And that's what the Federal FTA New Starts and Small Starts are. It's the national funding program for major projects like the Northwest Rail Corridor, um, like other corridors, um, to provide federal assistance, but it's competitive and you have to meet certain bars and thresholds in terms of costs and ridership and impact on the community. And uh, we have concluded that, um, that that possibility doesn't exist for funding for um, our unfunded corridors including the Northwest Rail Corridor. Then we ended on- uh, For any one of the four corridors. Say that again, I'm sorry. Okay, so- Possibility for any one of the four corridors. So the only corridor that potentially it would be competitive is um, based on the current FTA standards, rules, and um, um, competitive criteria is the Central Corridor in Denver. That's the extension from 30th and Downing Right. Um, uh, uh, north to a connection with the University of Colorado A-Line. So on the cost effectiveness, community impact, and um, similar types of measures, it would be competitive. 
Um, however, in terms of being able to show uh, RTD local match dollars, as well as our capacity to operate and maintain that, um, which is the financial measures that FTA also would hold RTT to, um, we don't have the capacity to prove that we can do that while still um, keeping all of our system, our base, what we call our base system supported by six tenths of percent and our four tenths of percent fast tracks. We, we could not demonstrate that financial wherewithal. But that one corridor um, potentially could be a candidate project for federal funding. Hmm. So um, then just a couple final points and I'll wrap up my five or so minutes of um, discussion. Um, we talked with the board about partnership opportunities. So the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission um, just completed their Front Range Passenger Rail Study in joint partnership and with support from CDOT. Um, so there's a good strong partnership there and support from CDOT in trying to um, look at and, uh, the opportunities for front range passenger rail. Probably the strongest potential corridor alignment north from Denver towards Fort Collins is the alignment that is the same as the Northwest Rail. And so, um, to that point or to that end, as that project moves forward, um, I have posited and, and I think um, our board of directors at RTD and the commission also agree, that there's real potential opportunities um, to advance Northwest Rail service, either that peak plan or eventually the full service plan um, in concert with that as one of the alternative alignments um, for a potential front range passenger rail study. And then um, Amtrak also has a proposal for a network modernization program, which would allow them to run if they were um, successful and um, a lot of work was done. Um, is successful in getting funding for this new program under reauthorization um, federal funding reauthorization at the federal level as part of new surface transportation funding bill, they could provide up to 100% of the capital costs and initial operating costs for the first few years of um, a front range corridor service. Three round trips daily is what they have talked about and proposed. They say it's one of their highest candidate projects at, um, variously between Fort Collins and Pueblo with intermediate stops. It would also share this quarter. So there's some partnership opportunities um, that um, are potential game changers. Uh, and um, RTD um, has expressed interest and continues to collaborate on all of those. I represent RTD on the Southwest Chief Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. So recognizing that our work on the Northwest Rail is now dated. It's seven plus years old in our understanding of the corridor. Rail technologies, um, what, where stations are, where a maintenance facility would need to be located, um, environmental impacts, um, our engineering understanding. The landscape has changed in the interceding seven plus years since the last time we took a solid look at the Northwest Rail. Um, we as staff, when I say we, um, indicated to our board of directors at that early February meeting that within 60 days, um, we're targeting April, um, we'll come back with more information to the board and perhaps a recommendation as to how to proceed forward. Um, really anticipate focusing on that peak service plan and the opportunities for partnerships and the opportunity to advance design work and environmental assessment. So we have a better understanding of costs and impacts and what the project looks like today, seven to 10 years later than our last deep dives on this study. And so make some 
um, provide some more information and recommendations on how to advance those sorts of topics um, with, um, with our uh, stakeholders, with our board and moving it forward. So that's kind of Bill Van Meter's attempt at a summary as to what's happening at RTD regarding the unfunded corridors in general and in specific a little bit more on the Northwest Rail Corridor. Bill, thank you for doing that. Uh, I, I realize it's always a little tricky when you're called unexpectedly to, to give a report like that, but that was quite comprehensive. I do, I do have a few, few questions. Of the uh, three different paths that, that uh, Far Range Rail is looking at, the Boulder Path is one of the three. Is there any uh, indication of any preferences in there? So um, I'll, I'll tread carefully because all three have been recommended to be advanced into um, the next phase of study, which could potentially be NEPA. And um, so we want to make sure all three alternatives, the um, three alternatives, again, real briefly, just so everyone's oriented, are, as you said, Rut, um, the Northwest Rail Corridor. Um, that through Boulder, through Longmont, and up north. A second one would be using RTD's north metro alignment, north from Denver Union Station to Fort Collins, right. and then extending um, north from um, our end of line, essentially. And then a third alternative bypasses Denver Union Station in the core of the Denver metro area, uses the 470 alignment, accesses Denver International Airport, and then comes around and heads up to, to Fort Collins. So those are the three alternatives. Um, you know, the work to date, our, our CDOT's modeling work in terms of ridership, um, I would say uh, political support and a fair amount of stakeholder support seem to be pushing towards Northwest Rail. It has higher ridership numbers, it has better or strongest political support um, and um, it had strong stakeholder support. I mean, frankly, it's hitting Longmont directly and Boulder and the US 36 corridor. And so um, that it, it's hitting more population centers, if you will, or accessing more hitting might not be the best word. Um, and, and so it might be, I shouldn't be prejudicing <laughs> the process like this, but based on the data I've seen and the discussions I've heard, right. it's probably the strongest candidate quarter. And, and if, as I understand it, the stops would would be uh, the main terminal in, in Denver, and then Boulder, and then Longmont. So it would it would only uh, really stop at those. And you, if you're going to do a passenger rail up and down. You know the the whole state. You, you can't stop everywhere. You got to be really restrictive in what you stop, where you stop. It's, it, it, that would still be the case, I assume, in the discussion. Yeah, yeah you know, um, refinement needs to be done. There are trade offs between adding more stops, which adds more time, but also improves access for people along the way. And there have been a lot of discussions about that. The, that next phase of study would look at those trade offs in more detail. There might be an intermediate stop, I speculate, between Boulder and Denver, um, but that could become hairy and difficult. It's certainly not all of the stops, to your point. Right. Um, far from yeah. all of the stops posited in a fast tracks Northwest Rail Corridor. Right. And um, the, the total number of trips a day that they're looking at right now are four. Two, two to the north and two to the south? Uh, all of that's TBD. Um, there, were, there were a range of service scenarios and alter alternatives identified. Who knows? Yeah. Too early. And yeah. this, is, this is all based on the phase one, $2 billion sort of initial project. I know that there is another one that is in the 12 to 16 billion dollar range somewhere somewhere roughly in there and uh, and and that there's there's some other possibility with that but this one would be a relatively slow train compared to 
if they ever got funding for that second big project. And I also heard a comment in uh, one of the articles I've read, and I think it was by the guy who was leading this the effort on Front Range Rail, that uh, that he thought it would be a 20 to 30 year out kind of project. Yeah, you know, all, all of that is hard to speculate. What are the funding sources? What's the governance structure? Right. Who's um, in all this? <laughs> yeah, and, and exactly. So who knows? Yeah. Fair enough. You know, we have to ask these questions, even though we probably know that you're not going to know the answer. To yeah, them, I was, was going to say, yeah, so... I'm either I either don't know or have maybe a personal opinion, but not one that would conform right. with either the commission or RTD's stance. So. Well, well, thanks for your service on that project. I, I personally uh, have a lot of skepticism about or about Front Range Passenger Rail, but you know I have been wrong so many times before. <laughs> so hopefully, once more through the fog. Okay, um, Ron, do we have anything else before we jump into the Line B Northwest Rail conundrum? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I, I will just um, add one thing to Bill's comment about the work that they're doing and just note for the subcommittee that the Dr. Cog team and our, our model team is sort of updating our forecasts and ridership forecasts for different sort of scenarios for Northwest Rail as well, just to help supplement and make sure we have, like like Bill said, a lot of the work, previous work on Northwest Rail is fairly dated. So we wanted to take a fresh look and just make sure that we have the most current and best um, information about sort of ridership and demand in that corridor. So that's in process. What's the timing on that, Ron? Uh, at least it's probably, oh, within, within 30 days, I think is definitely very doable. I think that's a, a fair estimate. Okay. All right. Um, shall we move on? The, you know, in, in looking at this problem, and I, I realize it is a, a very hot topic and, and uh, what I say probably will not make anybody or may certainly won't make everybody happy. But part of what uh, I felt we needed to do was take a hard look at the economics of the three things that uh, RTD is looking at in terms of the Northwest Rail project. And so uh, I sat down and tried to go through a variety of different options. Are you hearing noise in the background? I may have to do something about that. Alexa, off. Oh. That darn Alexa. Hmm. Gotta be careful what you say around her. Okay, so so if you look at the if you look at the economics, and, and this is a a cold look at it from an economic perspective. And uh, I expect there may be other opinions out there and and I don't you know I don't think this is the final word on this project but I do think the economics of all three choices are very challenging and so let me let me first say that you know RTD is facing uh, the most severe financial challenge in its history and the promises that we made 17 years ago when Colorado voters approved fast tracks they were based on assumptions uh, with regard to sales tax revenues. And the first thing that happened is we hit the, the Great Recession. And, uh, and then along the way, we built out a lot of rail, all of it had to be financed. And, um, and we're now in a situation where the COVID crisis is, is once again suppressing sales tax revenue and, and definitely just really creating great problems with ridership. So the original cost uh, has tripled at this point to, to between 1.5 and $1.7 billion for Northwest Rail. And uh, we also have the challenges that come from uh, the issues with uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad's right-of-way access that have added a lot of, of costs as well. And if you look down the road, uh, 
then 2042 is, is a long way off. And when you add time to a project like this, it usually adds cost to the project as well. And so that $1.5 billion estimate uh, may again go up from that. So if you look at the other side of the coin, the taxpayers from Broomfield to Boulder to Longmont are justifiably very disturbed about the service that they were promised to arrive and be available in 2017 uh, is now, now being projected to 2042. Uh, two decades into a very uncertain future. They're, they're demanding a solution uh, from a transit agency that has been financially forced to cut its services 40% over the past year. And, you know, this is an issue there's a lot of heat on, but there's not a lot of light on it. And, and uh, these are the three alternatives, okay? First off, this, this collaboration with Front Range Passenger Rail uh, that Bill just spoke to. Uh, it's, if you look at the routes, the, we are one of three routes that may be chosen, hopefully with the governor behind it and, and uh, uh, other, uh, other people encouraging this choice, they'll pick the Boulder route. But the, you know, it stops at Union Station, Boulder, and, and Longmont. And maybe we'll be able to squeeze one more stop out in between. But if you're going to do uh, a front range rail, you can't stop everywhere. And so I think we're, we're going to be faced with a limited number of stops compared to the B line, certainly. And, you know, two to, two to six, I think it sounds like, you know, in terms of round trips, uh, more like two or three. Um, that's just not a lot of service. It is a supplement, and, and it's good to have supplements, but it also depends on what it winds up costing. You know, it's still got that Burlington Northern battle to fight. Um, but if you, if you look at what they're talking about right now on that one, there's first off $2 billion that we have to find. And that's not trivial given the attitude of, of Colorado taxpayers from my experience on on uh, initiatives. And it's, if you look at the full version, you know, it's between eight and $14 billion. And it's also way out there, 20, 30 years. Uh, if you compare that to all the taxes paid to the state of Colorado, uh, given in, in 2018, total taxes to, to the state of Colorado is less than $11 billion. So the idea of a, of a visionary rail product uh, project that's going to cost between eight and $14 billion, I think it's going to take an initiative. That's the way you have to do it in Colorado. That's really hard to see happening. So I'm skeptical of, of that. Uh, and also because of the just limited amount of service that we're talking about getting. We're not getting much service out of that. But if it happens, then we'll, you know, we'll get an opportunity to capitalize on that, hopefully. So my next area that I, that I looked at hard was the Beeline rush hour only service. Um, and this would be operating five days a week, uh, except for holidays that fall on weekdays. And, but, but the real killer is, is the cost. Uh, estimates that I, the last ones I saw were $708 million. And that is uh, with an anticipated ridership of 1,600, 800 people, 1,600 trips per day. And I know that's going to be reviewed. And you may wind up being able to uh, come up with more optimistic numbers. Uh, but at that level, you know, the, there's a, a method that I use in all of these that I should explain in, in terms of how I did my analysis on them. And I said, all right, start with a, the number, the expected ridership and uh, the expected capital cost. Uh, but in this case, the ridership isn't, isn't a, it's a weekday uh, ridership of 800 people. But uh, if you look at 52 weeks times five, 
and you take 10 off for holidays, then you wind up with about 250 rush hour days per year. So that's when the service would be actually operating. And so you multiply that by the 800 people to get the total ridership on an annual basis. And, uh, and when you look at that uh, cost, there's also the annual operating maintenance cost, which I think has been estimates the uh, RTD Northwest Rail Study Session, I, I think came up with $13.5 million as the annual operating cost. Uh, and unfortunately, RTD has to pay interest on that $708 million, unless a gift falls from heaven somehow. That's a lot of money. And, and uh, I, I, in doing this, tried to use sort of the most optimistic parameters I could use. I use 2% as an interest rate. And if you look at the principal and interest that over a 30 year life, over uh, what would be spent to get there, uh, the, the total uh, amount of money you come up with on that is, is basically $1.132 billion for that $708 million. You add to that the $13.5 million operating cost every year, you come up basically with an annual operating cost of about $51 million a year. And if you've got 1,600 trips uh, times 250 days a year, then that's $128 per trip cost of operating that service. Now, if you can get people to pay enough, uh, even if you said, even with past, you know, with past discounts and everything else, maybe $4 a person per, you know, $8 round trip, they're going to go somewhere and go back for the most part, uh, which I think is probably a, a pretty generous estimate. But the net cost per ride then would, would still be $124. I mean, uh, Imagine a subsidy of $124, but how does that impact RTD's annual budget? Not in a very good way. So I, I just think it's an irrationally high subsidy. So let's talk about the, the regular B-line extension next. And um, using this same sort of methodology that I talked about for the rush hour service, I said, well, the estimates $5,400 per weekday. I, I'm going to raise that up to 7,000 per weekday. And um, if you do that, then you also, again, have to account for the weekend ridership because there'll be some riders on the week, weekends. But I looked at, at, for example, MTA in New York City, uh, their ridership typically is half of what it is on a commuting day, on a, a, a busy day. And theirs is probably a little generous because they have lots of visitors in New York City. But if you figure six, the equivalent of six days a week instead of seven uh, for that uh, cost, and you take 7,000 trips times 52 weeks times 6,000, it's about 2.184, zero, 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 2.184 billion, million, million trips a year. Uh, if you have a 30 year useful life and, and uh, uh, based on the estimated annual operating costs of the B-line uh, from the uh, RTD draft initial corridors report, uh, that was $20.6 million a year. Now, if you take that 1.5 billion construction cost and you use a 30 year bond and even at that low 2% interest rate over 30 years, uh, you wind up uh, basically combining in the operating costs coming up with a, a little over $100 million per year for operations. For operations, you know, plus, plus the cost of the, of the capital. So if you look at that 2.184 million trips a year, it works out to $46 a trip. Even if you get $4 out of people per way, 
uh, which you probably won't get with the past discounts and things like that. You know, you, you wind up with a $42 a trip subsidy on it. And, you know, that, that's like a, an albatross around RTD's neck. I mean, one, our, we have two responsibilities that I'm focused on here. One is how do we get the beeline built? And the other is how do we make RTD economically sustainable for the long term? And those two things just don't go together very well. I went in and I said, all right, parameter, you do sensitivity analysis on your parameters that you're using for something like this. So I took the estimated ridership uh, 5,400 and I doubled it. And I said, how does that affect, how does that affect the numbers? And you're, you're still winding up with a $30 a trip cost and $26 a trip after $4 for the, you know, for the payment for the ticket. And you, you know, you, you're still down to about a $52 round trip. And it just, I just can't see how to make the numbers work. I've looked at this, I've tried to play with different factors and things like that. I, I just can't make the numbers work on the construction of the B-Line. And I know that is gonna be a very unpopular conclusion with a lot of people. So, you know, the, this is a real conundrum for me. I, I look at all three of these solutions and I say, how do you make these things viable? You know, how do you, how do you look at different parameters and see how it could come into something that would be a, a rational thing? The other side of this is waiting 20 years for something to happen is just not a viable alternative. Uh, I don't see where there's a lot of money coming from anywhere real soon. And, and if there's nothing to accelerate it, not getting it to 2042 is certainly going to be an unacceptable thing to the governor and to a lot of the folks up in the Northwest Corridor. So I'm welcome to suggestions. <laughs> if anybody can take my numbers here and say, this is what you did wrong. And we can, if we do this and that, we'll get to there. Uh, I, I think we've seen the cost of building projects like this go up a lot. That, you know, the, the problem with the access uh, to, to uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, that added a lot to it. Uh, we haven't had the growth in sales tax that we expected. And we've also created a huge amount of debt for the rail that we've already built. And part of this is there, you know, RTD still has to service that debt. So um, please tell me how to solve this problem. Because <laughs> I can't quite figure that out. But I will say one other thing on this. And, and that is, I really, I, I'm convinced that we really need to focus on a lot more on bus rapid transit. These are things we can do, we know how to do, and we know what to expect in terms of, of performance. We've got metrics on things that we've, we've done recently that we can use. And so, you know, I, here's, here's a recommendation, okay? I, this is a first round draft of a recommendation, but that would be that in partnership with CDOT and local communities, RTD should aggressively seek federal funding and move ahead as quickly as possible with the implementation of the SH State Highway 119 BRT corridor project, which includes not just BRT, but also uh, bikeways. Uh, and that construction should begin no later than 2023, if at all possible. Uh, people need to see some folks out there working on the road to really get the feeling that, you know, their, their taxes are going somewhere. Um, but, but further to that, I, you know, I also think that RTD should prioritize the completion of the planning and partnership agreements that we need to develop BRT and bikeways on State Highway 7 and uh, State Highway 287 projects. And I know that State Highway 7 is pretty far along. State Highway 287 is still talking to all the stakeholders. What we want to do is get those things to where they're shovel ready because we've got an administration that really is looking for ways to invest in infrastructure. 
And those bills are going to be coming along. So the closer we can get them to shovel ready, the, the better when that federal funding really becomes available. So my, my last comment on this is that if you look at the, at the legislator, legislature and Governor Polis's 2030 10% greenhouse gas reduction goals, that RTD and its partners uh, should be encouraged to consider electric buses and those electric buses be powered by renewable energy sources in all of their future plans for BRT. No more diesel. So those are my thoughts and I am eager to hear someone show me the solution. But before we do, uh, Ron, could you pop up that slide that has the transit, uh, the bus rapid transit? images on it. Let me know when it's up. It's up. Good. These are those three pro projects. And, um, you know, I think if you look at the subsidies that we've seen, uh, and I've got some numbers, I need to really do more investigation of them, but it looks like the, the BRT subsidies are somewhere on the order of the regular bus ser services, basic bus services lines and RTD. And I, you know, I think in terms of long-term fiscal sustainability, uh, BRT may prove to be a lot more sustainable. I, I also think that there are some emerging technologies. If you look a few years down the line uh, in autonomous vehicles, for example, that may actually be very attractive alternatives as well to, to blend into this. And furthermore, I think there's some partnerships with TNCs, particularly in how we feed people into, uh, into these lines to deal with, uh, in some novel ways, the first last mile issues. Uh, I also think that could play a big role in, in building ridership uh, in any of RTD's projects. So, you know, with that said, uh, these are the three projects that I think are the ones that are closest to getting to that shovel ready position of trying to get some serious federal funding. Uh, the, the, uh, the first three that we talked about, uh, and Bill Van Meter made this point as well, the ability to get federal funding uh, on the economics of those three projects is gonna be really tough. It's gonna be really tough. So feel free to throw stones. But I, I do want to hear your comments and I do want to hear people's thoughts on this. Rebecca has her hand up and then I have some stuff I'd like to say. Great. Rebecca? I'll, I'll defer to our, our uh, overall chair first. Go ahead, Elise. Yeah. Elise? Well, I, I, sure. I, I, have, I have plenty to say about this, Rudd. Thanks for, for the, all the personal time you've spent looking into this issue. Obviously, yeah. this issue is near and dear to my heart being from the Northwest Corridor and I I know that we have our Northwest Corridor RTD uh, board members on this call as well. And it's something we hear a lot about and we care a lot about. And um, it's extremely important to, to make the Northwest Corridor whole um, given the fast tracks investment we've made and will continue to make. And the fact that, that the ballot measure was passed in 2004 on the backs of Boulder County voters because yep. we believe in transit and our ability to ask our voters to increase funding for transit is um, stymied by the fact that um, there feels like there's been a breach of trust on the, these corridors, these unfinished corridors, um, and the fact that uh, 2042 is the earliest, it looks like we can get um, the second half of our fast tracks commitment. Um, that having been said, um, if, if the uh, alternative is, is waiting for um, 2042 to get our mobility payoff from fast tracks, I think it is, a, it is um, worthwhile to ask the question if there's um, something that the Northwest Corridor can be given in the interim um, to provide for mobility. And indeed that was the impetus for the Northwest Area Mobility Study back in 2014 that identified um, bus rapid transit uh, on arterial corridors as um, mobility that could come cheaper and faster while we wait for the, the train. And RUT identified the first three of those BRT corridors. There's several more as well. Right. Um, 
I think there's a couple things. One, we all need to reach agreement on the same set of facts in order to have this conversation. And that's what will writership really be? And that's certainly a, a bit of a crystal ball exercise, but I, I'm heartened to hear that Dr. Cog's working on numbers. I know if we do uh, the 30% design study of peak rail, that's also a forum for looking at those numbers. We also need to have um, the same set of facts ar around costs. And I think it also would probably be useful to have the same set of facts around investment that um, the Northwest Corridor has made in terms of fast track sales tax, um, lest other folks in the RTD district want to know whether or not we're getting our fair share and what that is. I think it's worth being able to understand that. So I, I guess I think that step one is reaching a, a, reaching agreement on updated numbers. And I, two, several of those things are underway, but I think that that would be step one. Um, and in particular, RTD, should agree with these numbers as well as the affected stakeholders in order to have this conversation. Um, I also think if we're gonna have a discussion about what to do um, with this conundrum that we should seek feedback from other stakeholders on their ideas on how do you make the Northwest Corridor whole um, given the, the fact that you know a, a train that might come in 2042 doesn't work as a solution, so, so what might? And then we also need to recommend a policy for um, regional buy-in on whatever we come up with. Uh, and, and I imagine our recommendations will be saying to RTD, here's some things that we suggest that um, you do in order to reach resolution on this. But having some regional buy-in is important. The last time the region really weighed in on this was 2004. There are a lot of things that have changed since then. Certainly RTD's financing, you know, a global pandemic, a couple of recessions, but also um, in the positive, we have a, a pro-rail uh, president. We have uh, climate targets that require us doing more with transit. Maybe that target comes with some money, it should. Um, so there's some other things that have changed. Um, and so I think we need to update the context in which we're having this conversation as well. Those that are was, my initial that was excellent, Elise, that really was. Um, I. I agree with everything you say. Um, it doesn't keep, mean that I now believe we can build Northwest Rail, but I do think that uh, I do think that we ought to look at that no stone should be left unturned in, in trying to find a solution to this. Because you're right, there were commitments made uh, back in 2004 that 1994, 2000, 2004, no. When was, when was Fast Tracks uh, passed? 2004. Okay, 2004. So um, th that were made that are long overdue and that there isn't a, a, a really viable plan to be able to do that in the time frame that we have. And uh, this is probably in many ways the toughest issue that we're facing. Uh, but, but I've come up empty when I look at the economics. So let's engage other stakeholders and see if we can find uh, find ways that we can get at this. Then, did you have something you wanted to add? I saw you light up for a moment. From me, is that what you asked, Rhett? Yes. Did you have something else that you I wanted? I have some things to add, but I, I think I'll wait a few minutes and hear some other comments. Sure. Thanks. Rudd, can, are you, Rudd, are you still not able to see when people raise their virtual hands? I can't, it would really help if you could, but Rebecca had something to say Rebe too. Yeah, Rebecca's hand up, hand is up, and then Julie Mullica's hand is up as well. Oh, good, good. Rebecca, you're on. Well, thanks, Chair. I, I don't know that I have a, a lot of new content out of the conversation, but I guess just perspective, um, you know, as you were talking, I, I, have, I have the governor's uh, voice in my head, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's been pretty clear in this area and, and in, in fact, went so far as to join RTD's um, special meeting on this topic. So I, I'm just, I really wanna make sure that um, to the extent this committee can help RTD meet this challenge and deliver Northwest Rail that we, we try to do as much in that space as we can. And I know that at RTD, you'll have to remind me of what the time frame is of this sort of feasibility study you're looking at, but I don't wanna get ahead of that and 
I think our work should really be informed and, and build on what RTD finds. And you all will have to remind me if that was 30 days or 60 days out. So but, if, I, if I may um, address that question, uh, Mr. Chair and Rebecca, um, just want to share that where we are currently, we said within 60 days and for all intents and purposes, that'll be before the end of April. Um, without speaking too much out of school, uh, I met with my team just yesterday afternoon as we carved out our path forward. So we endeavored to double back to the board in mid-April at a committee meeting to share some information. And, um, you know, as we do all of that, I want you all to be clear the perspective from which we are coming. It's imperative that we engage people. We can't do this in a vacuum. And so the whole notion behind what um, Co-Chair Jones said as relates to stakeholder engagement, that is something that is top of mind for us as well. And that's something we endeavor to do. So recognizing I said that we come back in 60 days, there's going to be some steps that are interwoven in that to ensure we're being very transparent and forthright in the, in the path in which we want to travel. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair Malika, would you uh, please? My, my comments were actually very similar to Rebecca's, um, really just about the feasibility study. And I feel like that's kind of our initial first step. And then, you know, I'm just kind of curious what, what's going to happen after that, because I agree with Elise that, you know, how do we all get on the same page about this and start having, you know, the same truths, I guess, um, regarding this and, and opportunities moving forward. And then what does that look like um, after the feasibility study? How do we bring in perhaps like um, a regional work group or something on this to get feedback, to get ideas? Because I think everybody, in the end, everybody wants our TV to be successful. And so how do we um, accomplish both those really huge tasks of those unfinished fast tracks corridors along with, you know, RTD's financial success. So I think that that's a really <laughs> a huge thing to try and accomplish. And so it's gonna take a lot of work, but yeah, I was gonna agree with Rebecca, like the feasibility study I think is um, the, our next first stop. Well, I am by no means ready to pull the trigger on a recommendation. I, I think that there's, there's a lot that we still have to, to dig through and to really understand. And Elise was totally uh, uh, on target when she pointed out what those things are. And um, we will be getting more information on this, on this challenging problem in the, in the next weeks and months. Fortunately, we do still have some months before we have to finalize our recommendations. Any? Uh, yeah. Yes, please, Lynn. Thanks. Um, you know, as, as I think you, you all know, I wear the usual two hats of an RTD board member, but specifically on this one, I represent, um, along with Eric Davidson, who's also on the call and may want to speak, um, the Northwest Corridor. And uh, of course, as a board member, uh, I'm watching the fiscal sustainability of the agency as at the same time, you know, right now is the right time to be looking, doing this design study. Uh, the Amtrak and Front Range Passenger Rail, you know, I don't have any way of judging, but as you point out right there, you know, they've got their own problems, but, um, you know, they call our new president Amtrak Joe. Um, <laughs> That's right. you know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll get some money. The, the infrastructure bill, uh, the funding or stimulus bill, it may not be limited by new starts and small starts standards um, and uh, Amtrak would presumably, they're going for requesting the capital costs and early operation costs. So it can change the, the uh, financial view as well. Um, you know, I think uh, is the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition and what we're doing, Eric and I and, and others, is really urging two steps that RTD take a stand in favor of the Northwest Rail um, in terms of Front Range Passenger Rail and Amtrak in terms of that corridor. And then of course the 30% the design study. And, and I agree with um, Deborah Johnson and, and other comments that the critical piece here is, uh, a critical piece here is, is uh, the transparency and, um, and by making it very clear the costs and the ridership numbers in a way that that uh, people, stakeholders up here in Longmont and elsewhere 
can can really say we trust those because they don't right now. Um, the numbers are old and, and I don't think they were as, uh, it, at least they don't see the transparency anymore. Uh, I'm glad to hear that Dr. Cog is looking at ridership projections and, and may have those soon um, because I think it, it may be helpful to have a separate party uh, looking at that. Uh, I agree with your analogy, Russ, Rhett, and I use it a lot, that, our, that this is the albatross around RTD's neck. And uh, so I appreciate the accountability committee looking at these things. Um, and I share your focus on BRT in the short run. And, and I think Elise expressed that well. There are a lot of things that can be done to improve mobility in this area. And, and the ones you mentioned, Highway 119, you know, hopefully we'll have that ready to go in the near future. And uh, RTD is committed as, as well as CDOT and, uh, and other funding sources, some of the local governments, Highway 7, Highway 287 um, are also very important. Uh, so I appreciate all of this. And I think I also appreciate Rebecca's comments that there's a lot of political pressure on this. You know, the governor's view is that uh, you, if you promised it, you have to do it. Um, and that that's, that's how you keep government, uh, the, the trust in government. It's just a very tricky, tricky issue here, but it, it's a good point. Um, so uh, I hope we'll move forward with the design work. I appreciate you, your comments on this and thanks. Just one follow up to that. Uh, I, I think in terms of, I think inevitably there may need to be another source of funding if, if Northwest Rail is ever going to get built. And it will do a lot for the competence of the people up, up in that region if they can see some people out there with shovels that are, that are actually building something that are, that are adding the, the uh, uh, BRT services and bike lane services. Uh, and and uh, that, you know, a, a few ribbon cuttings would help mm -hmm. along the way. And that's a very good point. You know, it's just, we need more revenue <laughs> um, yeah. and we will in the long term, so. Yeah. And the other thing is, even if, if you look at what the ridership's likely to be, are there ways that we can really supercharge that ridership? Are there ways that we can bring more people in, uh, in to use the services? And so I'm working on some, some things here I hope to talk about at our next meeting. Okay, uh, Dan, I saw your hand. Dan Blankenship. Yeah, thank you, Rhett. Um, you kind of stole my thunder. Um, in order to make uh, light rail cost effective, you, you know, the more people we can get to use it, uh, the more cost effective it's going to be. And in order for the region to achieve its air quality and congestion reduction goals, there needs to be, a, you know, kind of a comprehensive strategy, I believe, that makes the cost of driving uh, more expensive for people in order to make uh, the alternative, which would be light rail, more attractive. Looking at the, you know, the forecast of population growth in that region and how congested highways are currently, I can't help but imagine that uh, ridership would be higher than these opening day numbers that are seven days year, you know, seven seven years old. Um, and uh, even at that, with those numbers, those are going to grow over time. Uh, but if you can add later on these other travel demand management policies, uh, you can maybe, like you say, supercharge the ridership and uh, get a lot more people using the service. One thing that was evident to me in doing this analysis is the one parameter that has the biggest effect is ridership. And so that's, I think, going to be a, a key to this is how do, we, how do we find ways to grow that? The plan in our agenda originally was that uh, that would be the next topic. Uh, but I'm happy to delay any discussion of that since we're closing in, but we're not there yet. So, uh, Lynn, you said you'd raise your hand real briefly and just then I want to get to others. Just one other really quick point, which is that, you know, Boulder County studies in this, uh, in this corridor that on Highway 119, about 30% of that traffic now is coming in from Larimer and Weld counties. So, uh -huh. um, Ron, I guess it's a, it's a, just a heads up for you. I don't know what your process is in terms of looking at ridership, but um, I would hope that uh, that we would capture some of that as well. 
That's a it's an excellent point, Lynn. That's um, <clears throat> definitely definitely um, uh, considered in our in our forecast processes, and we're we're well aware of that dynamic, and it's folded into our estimates. Great. Ron, rather than trying to go to the next uh, topic, uh, let's uh, take another. Do you have some hands up that you can see that I can't? I do not. Not amazing. Actually, okay. just I have one final comment on the BRT. I agree with Lynn. It would be useful to get a greater understanding. And I, I think um, it would also be useful to get input on um, how we can make BRT happen faster. Um, certainly in the construct of, of making the Northwest Corridor whole, it's, it's not a bad discussion to have from a CDOT perspective either. Um, and uh, so if there's ideas on how to... Um, improve the financing to make that happen faster. We know it's cheaper and we know it's a, a more nimble mobility source. I think that that would be useful to this conversation as well. Yeah. Mr. Chair, may I ask a clarifying question as it relates to the nomenclature we're using as it relates to bus rapid transit? Uh, and I'll qualify this statement uh, by saying when I first were initially acclimating myself, I use BRT, recognizing it in a different fashion, right? So when I hear BRT, are we talking about fixed guideways? For all intents and purposes, we're talking about rubber tires versus steel wheels. We're talking about, you know, exclusive right of way to really entice someone to want to use it. Or are we talking about over the road coaches utilizing express lanes? for the means of expediency to get somebody to and fro. So what are we talking about when we use the term bus rapid transit for my edification? There's, there's a term for the kind of lanes that they, they uh, have been using here in, in this area and they're called managed lanes. And that means that um, they're generally open to, to people who have, you know- Oh, hot lanes we're talking about. That's what we're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But they're also available to people that are willing to pay the price of riding in those. Ron, would you comment on that? I, I'll, I'll defer to Elise uh, um, if she wants to answer that. Well, I think um, Deborah's uh, totally right that BRT in its highest form is something different than what we have in Colorado. And mm -hmm. we have long lamented that fact and have pushed RTD and other transit agencies to try to give us true BRT. But it really, it's context specific. It's as rapid as we can make that bus mm -hmm. um, in whatever corridor we're working. Um, in my neck of the woods, you know, the express lanes on US 36 are sort of the BRT model that we're using, recognizing that that doesn't, that doesn't qualify as BRT um, in, in Europe or other places, right? But, um, uh, but for, the, for the long distance highways that we're covering with US 36, we're, we're using coaches. And, um, so I, I, it's, as, it's as good a BRT as we can get. No, no, and I appreciate that. And that's just for my own edification because when I was talking about this issue before, I think in which I ripped the Band-Aid off, I was speaking from my understanding of BRT being separated guideway. And so as we go forward, I just wanna ensure that I have an understanding of what it is that we're referencing. So I appreciate the clarity. Thank you. And, and the point there I think is that in Colorado, it is so hard to get tax dollars for things out of the public when they go to the initiative process, we have to vote on every tax increase. And it, it really forces us to do things like manage lanes to pay for it. Okay, I look at my clock and it's by golly, 1230. And I always love to try to end our meetings on time. I know you're all important people with busy schedules. So uh, unless there's further comment, I'd like to call this meeting adjourned. Okay. Adjourn. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for a great civil discussion on a tough topic. <laughs>